Hi, I'm Dan Garcia. I'm a UC Berkeley EECS teaching professor. Hey, wait, that's not me. That's, get out of here. Ridiculous. <laughs> that wasn't me, that was the Games Crafters logo. My name is Dan Garcia. Welcome to Cal Week 2020, the virtual edition. I wanna to talk to you about my research and development group with undergraduates called Games Crafters. So we've had, I, I created this group in 2001 based on my interest in game theory, and I've had 600 students since then. This beautiful picture on the right you see of the students in my recent semester. It's great, students get to work in pairs or larger groups. Students return every semester, or mostly return every semester to take on larger and larger projects, um, and we average about 20 students a semester. We strongly solve abstract strategy boards, uh, abstract strategy games and puzzles, and I'll tell you about that in a couple of slides. Um, we've got 70 games and puzzles in our system, and we once you have them solved, we can play perfectly against an opponent, and we can do post-game analysis. So let's dig deeper in what those words might mean. So what is game theory? If you said, I went to this amazing Cal Week online presentation about game theory, well, there are three categories uh, of game theory, and your friends might think that it was one of the others. Let's make sure you know what you're, you know, your friends know what you're talking about. The first is economic game theory on the far right. So economic game theory is the most common game theory. If you just said, I do game theory, that's what they probably mean as economic game theory. That's about maximizing profit. You've often got simultaneous moves like rock, paper, scissors, rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Well, that was an economic game theory event. Prisoner's Dilemma is also a common economic game theory action activity. On the far left, we have combinatorial game theory and Professor Elwin Berlekamp was one of the three founders of UC Berkeley was one of the three founders of that. And those that's a study of games, of games that people play, two-person board games, and often multiple person, but for here we're going to talk about two-person board games. But those are special category of games in which you have to get the last move to win. So if the winning condition is something weird like three in a row or capturing a king, they don't handle that so well. We came in and I'm we, our group thinks about using computational horsepower, using the power and the search ability of computers to solve every other kind of board game that isn't the combinatorial game. Mostly we don't solve the combinatorial games, we let those to that group, and we solve every other kind of board game. So our games can end anyway, it can end um, in any possible uh, ending condition for that. So common games that you might know there are tic-tac-toe, chess, connect four, and Othello. So a computational board game is what you're going to learn about in this group. But what do you mean by board games? I mean, there's a lot of board games. What do you mean by that? Well, first of all, there can't be no chance. The game has to be deterministic. So there can't be no shuffled cards, no dice, nothing that makes it random. Both players have to know everything there is to know about the game. That's called having complete information. So they, ha they can't gotta have hidden information like in the game Stratego or Magic where it's still no chance, but I don't know what's behind you know, your hand and you don't know what's behind my hand. There has to be all complete information. Every player has to know everything there is to know about the game. There can only be two players. Other kinds of game theory study three or more, but we only study two player games. Kind of like the kind you grew up playing. Uh, usually you alternate moves. You can have a situation like in the game Othello, also known as Reverse Eye, where you have a repeat move where one person can't make a move and has to pass, and the other person would make two moves in a row. So that's okay. So you can have a skip move or a repeat move, but you can never have a simultaneous move. One, twice, three, go. You can't ever have a simultaneous move that way. And as I said before, the game can end any way. Four in a row, a capture, anything you can think of, we, we can handle those games. So here's how we do it. Let me just show you a little bit of snippet of the movie War Games, which shows a young Matthew Broderick as a child actor trying to get a computer to play itself in tic-tac-toe so we could explore the game space. So I'll just watch that for a second. Here we go. It hasn't learned. Is there any way to make it play itself? Yes. Number yes, of players, number players zero. zero. Nice accent there. So now it's playing tic-tac-toe against itself. And it's learning. Okay, that was that move was good. That move wasn't so good. It's recording all of these things. It's actually learning as it's doing this. Pretty cool. So what's nice about this is that you're seeing the actual system that, in some sense, exactly what our system does. It plays tic-tac-toe against itself over and over and over in solving tic-tac-toe to explore the entire game space. And so this game, I'll, I'll skip past this, but 
That's the idea. It does exactly that. It plays every possible game of tic-tac-toe against itself to solve tic-tac-toe. In fact, tic-tac-toe was one of the first games we solved. So the goal is to then build a strong solution. Now, what is a strong solution? Well, let's start, let's start at the basics here. This is, by the way, this is the hardest slide, so stay with us for this. So we're going to assume always alternating play. Your turn, my turn, your turn, my turn. Okay. This is the value for the player whose turn it is. So it, oh, it's kind of an egocentric way of thinking of it. If it's my turn, the value is the value to me, not to you, because you're my opponent, to me. And then when it's your turn, the value is the value for you, So if it's your turn. So it's always the value for the player whose turn it is. Okay, we've got a winning position, a tie position, a losing position, and a draw position. And we color code these Green for win, yellow for tie, and red for lose. Do you know where you've seen that before? That's right. It's an upside down traffic signal. So let's dig deeper and actually understand what that might look like. So a winning position. So a winning, but by the way, let's think about this. Circles are positions, arrows are moves, okay? So a winning, here we go. A winning position is defined right here. What's the definition? As you have a losing child. Now, you think about, it, I have a position, all the moves emanate from me are moves that lead to my children. So the parents are on top, children on the bottom of this kind of tree. Kind of like a parent and their kids. So winning right here has four kids. All right, now a winning position can have lots of different kids. Can have a winning child, can have a tied child, can have a losing child. But the definition of a winning position is one in which there exists a losing child. So because the win has this losing child, I know the parent is a win. So anytime one of your children is losing, you're a winning position, okay? How about a losing position? Let's skip to that one now. So a losing position is one where all of your children are winning. It means that anything you do is gonna make a losing move, giving your opponent a winning position. So there's nothing you can do. So in losing positions, like you're stuck in a corner and there's no good option there. A tie position is kind of in the middle. Remember, we're looking for our children, and we're saying, well, if I have a losing child, I'm a winning. That's the first one. If they're all winning, then I'm losing. Well, there's something in the middle if you can have a tie child, but no losing child. So a tie position is one in which there is a tie child, but there is no losing child. See this guy? There's none of those. So I don't care that I have these winning children. These are all bad moves. These are all bad moves. You don't want to take those moves. That's a losing move. But you do have a tie move, and that's better than taking the losing move, so you take that one. So a tie one is that you don't have a losing child, but you have a tie child. And a draw position, so a draw position is one which is interesting. A draw position is one where you can't force a win or be forced to lose, but you can just kind of play forever. It's kind of like two kings wiggling back and forth. And so there might be some moves that are losing moves, but if you don't, you don't have to take them. There also are good moves that just kind of stays around and doesn't lose the game, and you kind of wiggle around forever. And so draws are kind of boring, um, but they're distinct from ties. Tie means the game is over. Draw means you play forever, okay? We also care about remoteness, which is how long the game gets played until the game ends. So we kind of calculate that as well when we're walking down the tree. Let's ground this with an example. So the example is the simplest game we could think of. It's a game called four to zero by one or two. Here's how it works. You got four coins on the table. On your turn, you can take one or two coins and throw them away. And the person who clears the table wins. So on your turn, you take one or two from a running total, kind of more, more, more precisely. Total initializes this four. On your turn, you can reduce total by two or by one. And the person who brings total to zero wins. So clearing the board wins. This is the game. Look at that. Beautiful. That's the whole game tree. So four has two moves to three and two. Three has two moves to two and one, et cetera. Isn't that cool? So we're going to be able to walk this game tree, play a game. Let's actually have an example game. Let's pick some random people. I don't know, but how about Oski playing the tree? I love it. So let's try this now. Oski's going to go first. Oski has four. What does Oski do? Think about it. In fact, pause the video and then come back because we'll kind of play it through a little later. But play this with your friend even and try to figure out what the best move would be. Okay, welcome back. So Oski decides to take one to make it three. So Oski had a four, takes one away. Now there's three. And now the tree is sitting at three. What does the tree do? Well, the tree is going to take 
two away to give back Oski the one position. So Oski's sitting at a one. There's only one move you can make from one, which is to win, and Oski claims that victory. Cue the band. Love it. That's great. So the question you might want to ask is, did Oski play perfectly the whole time? Or did Oski luck out because it messed up, but the tree messed up also? What happened? Or is the game a first player lose? Should Oski have lost, but then, and made whatever move it made, because remember, losing position has only losing moves, but then the tree messed up and gave it back to Oski. Who knows? So here's the fun thing. That's what we're going to do by strongly solving this game. So actually, let's do that. Let's bring back in, whoop, let's bring back in the definition of a win, a lose, a tie, and a draw. By the way, there's no tie and a draw here. Let's just wins and loses. But let's look at that and see whether we can figure this out. All right, here we go. So we're going to start from the bottom up is the key thing. The first to get to zero wins. You know that. So that means if it's my turn and I got to zero and it's your turn, now you're on zero. Well, if you're on zero, you're lost because the person who just made the move to zero won. That's the definition of the game. So we can already start coloring our board. Let's do it. So zero, we know, is a losing position. All right. Well, when we have a losing child, what are we? Are we a win or lose? Do you remember? Yes. Thank you. If you have a losing child, you're a win. So let's look at that edge. That's the winning move that yields the losing position for your opponent. So that means both the parents, parents in quote, of zero, which are two and one, can be labeled win. And the moves that go to zero are the winning moves. Let's do it. Yoink. Love it. All right, let's keep it going. We're doing great. Next, what do we do now? We've got a, do we know what well, there's an edge from two to one? Holly, what is that? I don't know. Well, Look at the picture. I wiggled it over here for you. A move from a win to a win is actually a fumble. It's like you should have won the game, but you gave it away and gave the win to the other person. So that we can label as a losing move. If I had two and I'm about to, I could have won by making my winning move, the green move, two to zero. But I gave it up and I messed up and I fumbled it. Now you're going to win the game or could win the game. Not necessarily always, but in this case, yes, always. Okay. So now let's think about it. I got four. Does four have both of its children determined? Not really. How about three? Three has its children determined. Both of those children, two and one, have values. So we can figure out the value of three. What do we do? Well, the value of the children of three are a two and a one. They're both wins. Do we know what position, what, what, what's, the, what's my value if all of my children are wins? Amen. Exactly right. I'm a losing position. So three is a losing position. And both of those edges got nothing but losing moves. All those edges, all those edges are all losing. We can label them over there. Perfect. This is great. We're doing really well. Now we go back and we're working way back up the tree. So now four. Four has both of his children determined. Four says, well, I got a winning and a losing child. What am I? You guessed it. Four is a winning position because it has a losing child. So we know that four is a win and it's move. So yeah, that's the winning edge. And the Edge from four to three is a winning move. And now we say, what's four to two? I don't know. What's a win to a win? We saw this before. A win to a win is a fumble. So four to two is a fumble giving the control to the other player. And so four to two is a losing move. We've done it. We've labeled the whole game tree with winning and losing moves, which are the arrows, and positions. So now let's do the following. This is the fun part. Let's revisit the game we saw before and see what happened. This is the analysis we can now do. We're kind of walking you through what we can do with our software once we've completely solved that tree. So let's go back. It was Oski's turn and Oski had four. Remember what Oski did? It took one. It made the winning move. So let's go back. Oski should have won and or should have made the winning move, should, have, should be able to win this game because it starts from a winning position, did make a winning move. So it's on its way to do that giving a losing position to the tree. Now the tree's at three. No moves that are, no, there's no good moves there. We know a definition of losing position is no good moves. So the tree makes whatever it does, it takes two. So now Oski's at a one, which is a winning position, and Oski makes the final move to win. I love it. So actually both players play perfectly. It's just that Oski started from a winning position and made every possible. Turns out the losing players, if, if you are a losing player, kind of, 
meaning you're set up to lose. Oski was set up to win, the tree was set up to lose. I kind of did that by giving Oski the winning position, letting it go first. Both players play perfectly. And there's nothing the losing player can ever do. If the winning player plays perfectly, it's always a green move from a green position to a red for the losing player, and that player is nothing they can do. It's like you're helpless. So the tree was helpless in this case. And if this game had gone on for 55 moves and Oski always made the winning move, then the tree would have been helpless every single time. That's how the game works. Let's play another game. One more game, okay? Oski's turn on four. Rather than making out taking one, what if it takes two? Oh, that's a fumble. It made a losing move, now giving the tree control. Now the tree is the winning player, and in theory, if the tree plays perfectly, they'll win the game. But what does the tree do? You guessed it. The tree makes a losing move. That's like the tree getting the fumble, running 98 yards, and fumbling it on the one-yard line of its own. So now, Oski has the control again. Oski picks up the ball, and you know that from one to zero, we've seen this before, we've seen this game before, Oski wins the game. So, you could have watched this game. Take two, take one, take one, and you say, well, what did they do? We now know this was two fumbles in a row. Oski should have won the game, fumbled, the tree fumbled, and then Oski took it home. So these are two different games, but they end up with the same result. Cal wins. Cue the band. All right, that's it. That's what I got to show about game theory. Welcome to Cal Week. We're so delighted you're here. Enjoy our activities that we have for you on our website, and go Bears!